Welcome to the module on dynamic range. So if we take a typical audio signal, like the one represented here over on the right, one of the basic things that we will almost always be able to observe about such signals is that they have parts in them that are at lower amplitudes, lower levels, and parts in them that are at higher levels or higher amplitudes. And this is an important consideration because of two problems that come up, two challenges. So challenge number one has to do with noise in the final listening environment. Let's say we've got a recording, a recording project that someone has done, they've mixed all the various elements of the project together and they've finalized it and they're now they've now given it to someone who's going to listen to it in some environment. That environment will almost certainly have some kind of substantial noise floor in it. Um, in the diagram over here on the right, that noise floor is represented as this dashed line. And for the sake of argument, we're saying that the noise floor is uh, measurable at around 50 decibels SPL. And now this, this line here represents this an imaginary audio project that's being played in that environment. And the audio project has, for the sake of argument, a part that is much louder, a part with much higher levels, and a part which, with much lower levels. It has a, a dynamic range, in other words, between these lower and higher levels. So let's take a look at the higher levels in this situation first. Let's say that this section up here, where I'm pointing the mouse, uh, is the section of the piece or project with the highest levels, and that in our file or signal, that, that area um, peaks around zero decibels full scale, the digital maximum. And let's say that because that part is pretty loud, the person who is listening in whatever environment they're in, they have adjusted the volume on their system so that that loud part plays at 85 decibels SPL, in other words, they've adjusted the volume on their system so that loud part is tr being translated into really a, a, a very comfortably loud um, audio and sound pressure level in the room. Um, 85 decibels is that kind of level where you probably wouldn't want to listen all day at that level. Um, it's, sort of, it's comfortably loud. It's the kind of level that um, people will often use for listening in detail to music that they really love. And so now let's say that we um, let a little bit of time pass and now we're in this later moment where the levels really are much lower from our project. So they've gone down to minus 40 decibels full scale. So the levels are a full 40 decibels lower than they were. We could say that there's a dynamic range of 40 decibels that we have traversed in this transition. So now we're going to expect that our sound pressure levels in the room are also going to be about 40 decibels lower. So instead of it being 85, they're going to be around 45 decibels SPL instead. And they're going to be somewhat lower than the level of our noise floor. We'll probably still hear both things, but we definitely won't hear this as well as we would, um, as well as we might like to, because of the way it's competing with that noise floor. So we see problem number one that has to do with dynamic range here, which is that typically we're going to set our playback systems so that the higher levels in the system produce, um, produce sound pressure levels that are comfortable for us. And then what happens as a result of that is that the, the much quieter levels in the signal get pushed down um, close to or into the level of the noise floor, and it gets harder to hear the quiet parts of our audio. And what's the point of producing something if people aren't going to hear it? So this is problem number one with the dynamic range of our signals. And there's a second problem, too, um, which has to do with the stability of loudness. Let's say that we, we have this signal over here. This represents our average levels. And let's say that they're at about minus 20 decibels full scale in our digital file. And let's say that we're listening at around 80 decibels SPL, which again is a kind of a comfortably loud, 
uh, level for listening to, to music or what have you. And now we don't change anything except we get to a later point in the signal and the average levels go up by 20 decibels. Now they're more around zero decibels full scale. And roughly speaking, we can predict that we'll be now listening at 100 decibels SPL, which is really, really too loud um, to be safe and, and too loud to be comfortable under most circumstances. So what's going to happen is that the listener will have to turn down the playback volume um, to compensate for this instability, to compensate for this unpredictability of the loudness in the signals. And if you have a signal where people are constantly being forced to turn down and turn up the volume, that's going to be annoying to listeners, and they're probably not going to want to listen to what you're asking them to listen to at all. So that's the second problem with dynamic range. So because of both of these problems that arise, because our signals have a dynamic range, typically what we want to do in delivering audio to someone is to reduce the dynamic range of what we're giving to them somewhat. Uh, we want to reduce the dynamic range in ways that are appropriate to the context in which we imagine people are going to listen. Uh, for example, if we're producing something for um, an immaculately acoustically designed contemporary theater where the noise floor is very low, we'll be able to produce recordings with a somewhat wider dynamic range in that situation. Um, because the quiet parts of our audio won't be competing with as much of a noise floor. If we're making audio that we think people are going to listen to in very noisy places, like on the subway or you know in a, in a car or on headphones in noisy places, we're probably going to have to need to reduce the dynamic range quite a bit more if we want the quieter parts of, of that audio to still be um, um, perceived and to be um, for their details to be appreciated. So we have a number of strategies at our disposal for gently reducing the dynamic range. Some of them are things that in this course we're already doing a bunch of. And so really what I'm pointing out here is that we've already been reducing dynamic range by doing these things. For example, when we're mixing a project, we have multiple tracks um, playing in parallel, and as we make that project we're making decisions about the balance between those different tracks. And we're probably going to do that in a way that manages the dynamic range to some extent. When something's too quiet, maybe, the, maybe we push up its level a little bit. Also, when we reduce the noise in our recordings, when we, when we take special care to produce low noise recordings, we are helping to manage the dynamic range because that activity of producing relatively low noise recordings then gives us signals that we can make somewhat um, louder in our mix without worrying about introducing noise. So it's a kind of indirect impact on dynamic range. And similarly, when we manage the spectrum with filters, when we um, have a sound that, let's say, has some bass rumble um, that is moderately annoying, but maybe not too annoying. And then we use filters to remove that um, noise from that part of the spectrum. Maybe now the rest of that signal is able to be played at a different level where it speaks more clearly. And this is related to our management of the overall dynamic range. So we can produce recordings with um, reasonably context-appropriate dynamic range using these existing strategies at our disposal, but what we're going to talk about in this module and another one is how we can take this somewhat further using other tools. And the first of these is known as compression. And in introducing this term, we have to be clear, first of all, that when we're talking about compression in this module about dynamic range, we're really talking about the compression of dynamic range and we're not talking about data compression, which is about making files um, and uh, making files smaller and about making data more transmissible over the internet. No, here we're talking about the compression of dynamic range, about something that makes quieter parts closer to stronger parts. When we talk about compression as a strategy to deduce for dynamic range, we're talking about compression plugins, and these are plugins that push the quieter parts closer to the loud parts on 
a micrological basis. That is to say, from moment to moment, very, very quickly, they make changes to the levels of the audio that bring quieter things closer to louder things. And a closely related strategy is the strategy of limiting, um, which is, is compression, but done in uh, a more, in a, done in a stronger way, done with particularly strict parameters so that levels do not go above uh, a specific level and um, so that we use the full detail of our digital format. So the difference between compression and limiting is something we're going to come back to in the model that is specifically about compression and limiting and expansion. Um, but suffice it to say that we have strategies that we're already applying that manage the, manage the dynamic range, and we can also use compression and limiting to manage the dynamic range in especially detailed, fast-moving ways. So a key consideration as we start to manage the dynamic range in projects is going to be how we assess this. How do we know when we've done a good job of this? How do we know when we have the dynamic range of a project that we're working on? How do we know when we have it where we want it to be or where it needs to be? And so there are really two ways of going about this. One way is the subjective way. And the normal form that this takes is the comparison of your material, the material that you're working on, with other material that's already been finished and which you know has an appropriate dynamic range. For example, if you're trying to um, produce a song in a specific genre, maybe you play it back to back with another song by an artist that you admire where you're pretty sure the dynamic range is being managed appropriately. And you play them back to back on the same system without adjusting the volume of anything and make subjective observations about the differences between what you hear. And then there are objective methods, which basically refers to using specialized meters in software in order to, to get numerical measurements about the dynamic range and loudness of the material. And on that basis, you can, um, you can still compare to other material that's known to have an appropriate dynamic range. But now, rather than basing it on your subjective observations, you're basing it on numbers. So there are these two ways that we can assess dynamic range. And I think the, the, the final thing I would say about this on this slide is that I think that we need to use both methods um, to whatever extent we're able. I think we can always pull off the subjective method. Um, the objective method might be more difficult if we don't have access to those specialized meters. But even when we do have access to those specialized meters, I think we're still always going to want to uh, fall back on that subjective method because the meters are probably not showing us everything about what's happening in the dynamics of the audio that we're working with. So there's another unit that sometimes appears on these specialized meters, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and that's the unit, Loudness Units Full Scale, or LUFS. So sometimes you'll see this abbreviation, LUFS, on meters in audio software, and that stands for Loudness Units Full Scale. And so I want to explain a little bit about how that works and what it's for. Um, so over here on the left, there's a diagram that we've seen in another module. This is a diagram of the equal loudness curves. The, re the red ones are um, contemporary measurements for the equal loudness curves, and the blue ones are the historical Fletcher-Munson curves that were developed in the 1930s. And to review, what these curves show is how our hearing is more and less sensitive at different frequencies. For example, if we follow this curve here, it shows that we need a lot of energy to get an, a certain impression of loudness here in the low frequencies. And then as we come up to the high frequencies, the amount of energy we need to give the same impression of loudness decreases. And then as we get up into the high frequencies again, the amount of energy required increases again. And basically the graphs show that we are especially sensitive in this um, um, sort of high middle range 
where there you hear a lot of the difference between different vowels in human speech, for example. So th this is something that we first introduced in the module on spectrum. So what loudness units full scale does is it takes the um, some audio and it puts it through two filters in such a way as to reverse a very approximately the effect of the equal loudness curves. And so what we get, so the idea goes, is we get a new version of the signal that emphasizes the frequencies that required less energy to begin with. So the two filters, here are um, figures that were taken directly from the engineering recommendation that sets up this unit, loud units, loudness units full scale. And the audio goes through this filter first, and then it goes through this one. And if, if you look at the graph, it might be a little bit hard to see on the video. Basically what we see here is we have a low shelf filter where the audio passes through it's increased, it passes through at a higher level above about 2,000 hertz. And then below about 2,000 hertz, it, it rolls away, it goes down about four decibels, and then it stays flat all the way to the bottom of the spectrum. So we kind of see, we see a, a flat boost above about 2,000 hertz here. And if we look back to the equal loudness curves, Here's the 2,000 hertz line right here. And you can see on all of these curves, there's a kind of gentle increase in sensitivity as we go past 2,000 hertz. So this filter is basically modeling this part of the curve here. And then it goes through another filter. And this filter basically um, here is about 100 hertz. And so it rolls off sharply. It reduces the level quite sharply below 100 hertz. And that is basically modeling this part of the curve here. If you look from about 10 to 100 hertz, we have these steep increases in sensitivity. So to get loudness units full scale, let's say in a plug-in, what's happening is that the input audio is being put through this filter and then, then through this filter. And basically what that's doing is it's it's increasing the audio, increasing the level of the audio to the extent that it contains frequencies that are in these more sensitive parts of our hearing. And that gives you a very, very rough measurement um, of how loud the signal is going to be. It gives you a very, very rough measurement of how different signals might affect you differently in terms of loudness. Now, we can see here that there is a difference between what the equal loudness curves show and these filters that are used in loudness units full scale. And basically, that's that in the equal loudness curves, after we get through the high mids here, we go into this last part of the curve where it takes more energy to make us hear something in the very, very high frequencies. And that's not modeled at all by these filters. So if we're, if we're looking at it in audio software at meters that are in loudness units full scale, we might want to remember that they're not particularly um, being adapted for these high frequencies. So it's possible that putting very high frequency content through these meters um, might give us somewhat um, misleading results. Although I think that um, in, for most of the um, typical audio sources we'll be working with, they won't, they won't necessarily have um, enormous amounts of high frequency that we need to worry about it. So I'm going to switch over to Reaper. And I have a project set up here where I have three distinct recordings um, separated here. One is a field recording that I made many years ago in Venice in an, in an alleyway, kind of a typical field recording. Another is the an excerpt from Black Dog by Led Zeppelin, and another is an excerpt from the Roots' track, Don't Feel Right, 
And when we, when I get to playing the black dog and the roots for you, I'm going to turn the volume completely off um, so that we're not actually listening to those tracks for copyright reasons, but we'll still be able to see the analysis of them. Um, and what we'll be looking at the analysis with, what we'll be looking at th these things to do with dynamic range and loudness with is this Isotope Insight plugin that I quite like. And um, we're going to mostly pay attention to this measurement here, the integrated loudness units full scale measurement, which is a measurement over the course of a long period of time, like a whole track of how um, loud it is. And we're also going to look at this loudness range measurement, which is a measurement of how much on a, on a micrological moment to moment basis, the loudness in terms of loudness units full scale is varying. So I'm going to play the field recording here. And it takes a while for the meters to settle. All three of these recordings have been normalized so that their peaks um, go right to the top for the purposes of this exercise. So they all have peak samples basically at zero decibels full scale. But this one, this field recording that I know you can't really hear, it's got an overall integrated loudness reading of a, about minus 23 decibels, and it's got a loudness range that was usually somewhere around 8 loudness units, which are, again, they're like decibels, but they've been adjusted because they've gone through those filters to compensate for the different sensitivity of our hearing in different parts of the spectrum. So now when I move to playing the Black Dog, this piece of produced early heavy metal from the 1970s, and turn the volume down so we don't hear it. Although this recording, just like this one, peaks right up at the top, it's much, much louder. It's about 10 loudness units full scale higher than the raw field recording that we listened to. And if we look at the loudness range meeting, reading, it's also got a, a, a smaller loudness range than the field recording. And that's very, very typical, that for our field recordings to be quieter and with a greater variability of loudness range than the finished products that are meant to compete with noise floor in some listening, in, in some listening environment. And now when we get to the more, somewhat more contemporary track by The Roots, um, the hip-hop track, if we were to listen to this, it would, it would sound louder than the Led Zeppelin if we weren't gonna if we didn't do anything to the playback volume. And sure enough, right off the bat, our integrated readings are are creeping up higher than what we saw for the Led Zeppelin. And if we keep it going for a little while so the meters can settle, we're gonna see ultimately that our loudness range in this recording is also um, quite reduced with respect to the Led Zeppelin. So what can we take out of this? Well, we saw that when we had our, our raw recording, it had a, a lower loudness, despite peaking at zero, than the produced pieces, and that it had a greater loudness range. And so that just connects with our general observation that we made earlier that our record that our recordings typically have a wider dynamic range than what they need to compete uh, and to do well in a particular listening environment and then going from the black dog recording to the don't feel right recording we saw that these two recordings from different places and times and genres and people um, had different readings in terms of their overall loudness and in terms of the moment-to-moment -moment loudness range. Um, and if we were to listen to lots of pieces of heavy metal from the early 1970s, we would probably converge on a kind of average loudness and a kind of average loudness range for that genre. And we could do the same thing for hip-hop in the first decade of the 21st century as well. And so how can we use this information? Well, going back to what we said about assessing dynamic range um, objectively and subjectively, I think that if we know that the audio we're producing is in a certain genre, we can compare our work, our management of that dynamic range by listening to pieces in that genre under the same situations, or we can use meters 
like these ones, often calibrated in loudness units full scale, we can get numbers, measurements from pieces that we respect or pieces that we think are aiming at the same context we are, and we can use those numbers to augment our subjective observations with some objectively calibrated um, observations about how the dynamics are working um, in these pieces. So in this module, um, we've introduced the concept of dynamic range, basically the difference between the um, higher and lower signal levels in a signal. Um, we mentioned that captured or produced signals often start out with a very wide dynamic range, and that this introduces two problems. On the one hand, there's noise in the listening environment, so the parts of the signal that are at lower levels often have a hard time competing. And on the other hand, there's the problem of stability of loudness, which is that our levels, if our levels are kind of moving around all over the place in terms of loudness, um, we're going to probably annoy most listeners. We pointed out that there are subjective and objective methods of assessing dynamic range in our work, uh, and we can use those subjective and objective methods to compare our work to work in the same genre or situations that we're targeting. We also talked about the unit loudness units full scale, which is basically kind of like decibels, except that um, the signals go through filters that attempt to compensate for the unequal sensitivity of our hearing.